can't record it. I try to record. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Addiction 911 show. I'm Christina Rowe, the publisher of Addiction 911 magazine. And I'm here with Debbie Sherrick, who is the editor of Addiction 911 magazine. And we're going to talk today. We're waiting for our special guest who will be joining us shortly. But we're going to talk today about the pain of addiction and how it has its roots in your childhood. And this is a really deep subject, an interesting subject. And our expert today, who should be, I think he's popping in right now. Um, is uh, I'm going to read his bio as soon as he comes on. Um, he has some really great insights. Here he is. And let's see. Let's cross our fingers to see if we can get Brian on. Yes. I see it's joining Blab. So we're getting uh, a little technology, closer. white light around everything. <laughs> I see it says joining. So that's good news. You have to wait for him to pop in. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, but we can't see you, but we can hear you. So that's good news. Okay. <laughs> Step one. Step one. Step yes. one. This has been, this has been very challenging because every, the, everything has been going off and I don't know how to get, I'm looking for the video section okay. of how to turn that on. I, I don't the, see how to do that. The webcam on your computer. Well, at least we can hear you, which is great. And we were just talking about how this Mercury and retrograde is screwing all the technology up. Um, my computer just died last night. I'm actually on my phone on the app doing this right now. And, it's funny because uh, I was I was looking at the, going to the app to do that, and I was negotiating through two computers and and my phone and seeing which would post up. And and I know this computer that I'm talking to you on may just pull out uh, because the screen has been having problem. And I'm trying to sit here and how to figure out. There must be something to turn on my. Um, there should be a little camera up there, Brian, that you can click on for video. Allow yeah. camera. It's like on the top bar. It'll probably ask you if you want if you can allow the camera. Um, it'll usually do that with um, with the blab, like for the first time that you use it. Okay. Um, back a little bit here. It does say you have poor internet signal. That I have a poor in internet signal? Yeah, that's what it says under your... Um, oh. Okay. So why don't we do this? Why don't we just get started? Even though we can't see Brian, we can hear him. So okay. that's good. Very <laughs> that's good. Very good. Thing. So I'm just going to do... A, I'm going to just do a quick intro and, um, and introduce Dr. Brian Sheen. Okay, and he, you're, um, he's a best-selling author, lecturer, and founder of Quantum Embodiment. He utilizes the most advanced techniques in modern body, mind, spirit, transformational work available today to help a person realize their full spiritual potential. And he has a great smartphone app, which um, I just downloaded, and I love it. It's really, really good. It's uh, called The Seven Keys for Attention, Development, and Emotional Wellness. And um, he also has a course on that and helps people, you know, to access their inner pharmacy to be focused, happy and healthy without the need for most medications. Um, so he's doing some great work with that. I hear a lot of uh, feedback. Um, do you have your earphones in, Brian? I think we lost him, Christina. Oh, oh wait, it's coming back. Okay, let's see. Do you hear that? That must be me and you then. Do you hear that woo woo sound? Yeah, wow. I don't hear that. Oh, okay. Hopefully it's not on the recording. <laughs> we, just have, we just have to laugh at this because, this, you know, we, what are we going to do? It's the technology and... Uh, oh, yeah. It's, this is just, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Things yeah. you can't control, you just let go. That's all, right? That's we right. control it, we do laugh the, at it, right? Do, do the best we can. Right, exactly. That's all, it's all well, we can I, do. You know, I'm anxious to talk to Brian because of the him working with alternative medicine because, you know, that's my thing is, you know, working with um, holistically with clients with uh, alternative medicine. So I'm very anxious to meet him and hear from yes. him <laughs> about yes. this. Yeah, he's on um, my, like I told you, I met Brian a couple of weeks ago. I went to um, his class about A Course in Miracles, which he's been studying. He'll, um, I think he's in 30 or 40 years. And, and so it was just amazing. Um, and I've been wanting to learn more about A Course in Miracles for a long yeah. time. And I had a, a really big breakthrough during the class myself. And um, it was just incredible. So um, we started talking about addiction and, you know, and how and it really made sense of how this could really relate to, you know, the past, the pain. I mean, when, we're, when someone's addicted, they are masking the pain 
of the addiction with drugs and alcohol or whatever they're taking because they have some inner pain and it's usually rooted in childhood that's come up and in order and the only way to solve that is to go back you know and try to pull those you know those weeds of the addiction out um instead of just trying to put a band-aid on everything which is what we try to do you know there's a pill for everything right debbie <laughs> yeah that's right that's right yeah <laughs> Uh, I think America is, uh, people in America are, are very good at masking their pain. You know, there's so many, even, even when I work with my clients, this, with the uh, family members and, you know, codependency, uh, you know, the, the way that we mask pain and uh, even with my health and wellness people, that, you know, they're either, so many people today, they're either using uh, work and, uh, you know, staying busy all the time. We even have now, you know, the uh, uh, social media addictions and people masking, you know, escaping into that to not have to feel. Uh, we have, you know, uh, you know, of course, addiction, but people just seem food is huge. A lot of my clients use food uh, to mask pain and, and to not feel. And, you know, it's uh, we not like the Middle East and and middle or. Middle Eastern people and a lot of times European people, uh, I, I'm seeing in the last you know few years, maybe five to ten years, there is, there is becoming a shift more in America with people learning how to be in touch with more their higher self and uh, practicing yoga and meditation and prayer and spirituality, which has uh, not really been a norm thing for Western uh, people to really go inside and, and learn how to feel your feelings and get in touch with uh, your higher self and uh, meditate and, you know, all those modalities that a lot of Europeans and Eastern people do, Americans never used to do that. So uh, you're seeing more of that today, uh, but people are just so busy today and so stressed out. So many people use so many things to mask pain today to not feel. Exactly. That's, that's absolutely. And even gambling and like you said, yeah. all those different parts mm -hmm. of, uh, of are all there just to not feel, to get numb, you know, yeah. and to not feel like people when they get stressed a lot of times, Oh, let me have a glass. Let me have a drink because I'm feeling stressed out or anything to not feel what is actually going on. Right. Absolutely. And that's what I've done. Oh, hi, Brian. Hi, I've, I've had, just so you know, uh, I, I've had three times that the electricity in the house went out for about three seconds oh. and, shut off everything. So um, I apologize for any inconvenience and I'm sorry, I still haven't figured out how to get this video thing set up, but um, uh, it's so nice to, to be here with both of you and um, I'm hoping to uh, eventually contribute to the wonderful conversation that I know you've, you've started of looking at that, that need to, to be numb, to disassociate and to get away from the basic feelings of, of whatever a person has experienced. I think, I mean, that's what leads us to so many destructive behaviors and, and whether they be uh, addictions to drugs or addictions to even exercising too much or sex mm. too much or anything, you know, the, the need to avoid that pain and that suffering is what drives most behaviors, unfortunately. And, um, and uh, again, I'll contribute that for now and then step back because I want to make sure that I'm aligned with where you guys have been going and hope that my power stays on. <laughs> great. No, that's, that's great. Thank yes. you, Brian. And that's exactly what we wanted to, you know, get talk to you about because I know I was explaining how I went and, you know, we met a couple of weeks ago and um, it was an amazing, uh, you know, uh, uh, group that we had there. We talked about the Course in Miracles and yeah, I have a question for you. You know, we talk about addiction. We talk a lot about, people being, you know, it's a disease and it's, it's, you know, and, but yet we have this problem that it's, you know, a lot of, we're masking pain. So what, what is your feeling on that about the disease versus self-medicating? Well, I, I don't know. I, you know, when I think of a disease, I, I, I consider that something that you unfortunately um, obtain some type of uh, virus or some type of bacteria that, that gets into your body and takes things over. Um, and really, uh, because you're predisposed to it, um, it really takes over your system. And when I think of addiction, I don't look at addiction as a disease. 
Um, and I don't even like the word addiction, honestly, because I see it as a bad habit. Um, it, it's a habit that a person learned. We, we, we learn that the pain, the suffering we're experiencing, um, we need to get away from it. We need to numb it. We need to not feel what that is. And so we find different solutions. We find solutions that too often are alcohol or too often are drugs or these days too often are prescribed medications that, that help us disassociate and numb that pain. But, but I, don't, I, I don't see the under, underlying issue as a disease. I see it as a condition that's frozen inside the unconscious mind body that is interfering with the basic endocrine flow, sending messages to one's inner pharmacy that instead of sending out the messages to send prescriptions for good feeling, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, et cetera, it's sending out messages that there's fear, you're not safe, lots of increased levels of blood sugar, of adrenaline, of cortisol, and so that the person becomes in this agitated state, and, and in that state, for many people, it's perpetual, it's chronic. They're, they, they live in an unsafe home. Um, every day they go to work, they don't feel safe because they hate what they're doing. Um, they, they have very low self-esteem and poor self pictures. So they don't even, some people don't even feel safe walking down the street because they're afraid to be exposed, you know, to the horrible person they believe themselves to be inside. So, so this disease, I prefer to take it, I guess, taking it, it's a dis-ease within themselves of some negative training and habits, um, and so I guess that's the way I look at it, because otherwise a disease is something that happens to you, and a habit is something that you create, and then forget you create it, and it seems like it's taken your life over, which very often it does. D does that distinguish that for you all? Yes, and you know what, Brian? I'm going to play devil's advocate for some of the addicts, and uh, uh, you know, I also uh, work uh, as a codependency coach, I work with alternative medicine. I'm a master herbalist and I've worked with uh, holistic and alternative medicine for over 20 years now. And so I am on the uh, side, you know, what you're talking about, because we know about the, the things that happen in the brain. We also know about mind body connection and feelings buried alive, never die and that type of thing. But I want to, I want to play the devil's advocate on the other side, because I know what some, some addicts are thinking right now. Um, you know, I also grew up in an alcoholic home. I'm the oldest of four children. Um, and uh, growing up, I grew up in the late 60s and early 70s in high school and experimented, you know, dabbled with, experimented with marijuana, uh, THC, mescaline, quaaludes, that type of thing that people did at that time. Oh, yeah. Yet, I remember yet, that well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yet experimented with it, but never became an addict. Now, my siblings, however, my two sisters and brother also experimented, and they became full-blown addicts, um, and I have a lot of addiction in my family. So I know that in the addiction community, you know, that so many that do believe that it's disease, uh, you know, talk about the, the testing that's been done about the chemical, uh, and I wish I could remember the name of that chemical that they say is born in the brain, that is hereditary that determines whether you can become an addict to substance uh, and they that's how they determine it be becoming a disease that it is a hereditary genetic disease that comes from generation from generation and some people are born with it and not and you know I've often questioned myself you know my sister next to me ended up uh, uh, three years of three three and a half years ago, overdosing and dying uh, from drug overdose. And uh, my brother's in recovery, my little sister's in recovery now, praise God. But uh, I've often asked, you know, wonder, I'm like, by the grace of God, there goes me, because I was the only one out of the four of us who did not become an addict, but I, my behaviors were codependency and becoming, you know, the enabler, rescuer, and all of that. Um, that was my role in the family. So I know that there is, you know, both sides of the fence that people believe in, I think. To me, uh, also, it's kind of irrelevant uh, 
you know, you can argue and argue whether it's a disease or whether it's learned behavior and habit and that type of thing. I believe the bottom line is uh, getting, as you teach, uh, I believe, to the root of the problem uh, that the alcohol isn't the problem, the drugs aren't the problem, uh, the gambling isn't the problem, the pornography isn't the problem. It's unresolved things in the subconscious mind, uh, our belief system from childhood, that ha needs to be dealt with. I, I found that when people get healthier spiritually and emotionally, that they tend, I mean, I've known a lot of people who have claimed to be alcoholics, and as they have worked at a deeper subconscious level and worked at some of the root problems of shame and things like that, and false beliefs, uh, that they are able today now to drink socially. Right, right. Well, I, 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 I want to just say from all the research that I've done over the last 40 years, I know that they've looked very hard in order to find the hereditary link to addiction, uh, but it's not there. There, I, it, there are hereditary uh, markers that show tendencies, and that's the whole thing, is, is we have to understand the placidity of even DNA. DNA yeah. shows tendencies, and those tendencies have to be really wired in depending upon the emotional state that an individual lives in. Because even, even the addict, they can reach emotional states that are very empowering at different times in their life uh, that it may not last very long, but they fall in love and they feel great. They all of a sudden uh, achieve something wonderful in their career. And all the stressors in their life that before were weighing down upon them, all of a sudden just kind of move out and they get a momentary release and relief. And all of a sudden that, that impulse in order to have to, to get to that drug to feel good or to that alcohol to feel good, it subsides. Mm -hmm. so, so meaning, you know, if something is coming and going, then it, it's not in DNA because when something is in DNA, when you're a diabetic, you're a diabetic, you know, when you're feeling this, when you're feeling that, you may have sugar levels that, that vary up and down a little bit, but, but you already have a problem that is physically oriented in your system and all of a sudden you're not able to process what you need to do with the insulin. So that's a, that's a biological problem. So I, you have to look at, I think, is that these instances that happen, let's say to the four of you growing up, mm -hmm. each one of you interpreted those events differently. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Now, now the moment you say I'm from an alcoholic household, that alone means you are perpetuating the illusion that you have this sense of alcoholism as a problem because you're choosing through a very egoic mechanism, by the way, to only look at the negative, the alcoholic household. And every time you think of growing up, you send yourself a hypnotic command, well, I'm from an alcoholic household. Everybody around me was alcohol. We were all a bunch of alcohol addicts. So you see what happens is, it's this <laughs> hypnotizing event happens because every word that we use, every picture, every story that we tell, every thought that we have, every action that we take creates a biological response to our inner pharmacy. And when you're thinking like that and visualizing like that and talking like that, you have put yourself in this state of hypnosis of being caught in addiction, being caught that this is a problem, feeling that that is a burden to you today and something that really dominates and defines your life. And I'll tell you, that's what the power of hypnosis, because the power of the mind is whatever you say you are, you are. And exactly. Exactly. And, and if, and if you look back and say, you know, I grew up in a household. Okay. And I'm so blessed because I was so lucky that my parents, despite some difficulties that they had with drinking they were able to always provide a roof over my head they over always fed me i always had food to eat i always had the opportunity to have clothes to wear i didn't have to run around naked 
Uh, they always gave me an opportunity. Well, you, I don't know. Maybe you, you know, I, I did hear stories about you, but maybe you didn't. Know. But, but we won't bring that up here. But you know, I mean, they got you to school. So you went to school. And if you decide right here, right now, to rechange in your mind, to look at only the good and to redefine the, the opportunity and gift that you were given growing up, then all of a sudden the hypnosis that you keep yourself in because we're all our own hypnotists. We all hypnotize ourselves and then we all create every biological response in our system is going to be created by that story, by that thought, by those actions. You can all of a sudden completely resend new prescriptions inside that make you feel good and say, you know what? I was really lucky growing up in that household because my parents showed me what didn't work. And I made a decision that I'm going to sit there and do something different for myself, be grateful for all that they've given me and anything that wasn't love. I forget about, I let it go. I give it up. I see. That's what forgiveness really is. Means I, I let go of the story. I can't do anything to change it. And I, when I remember it, I only remember the good. And, then and I want to, I agree with that, but I want to preface this for our guests too, that uh, that is a process. You know, today I'm very grateful for how I grew up. A big up. process. A, a big process, process. A huge process. Yes, because, absolutely. you know, uh, uh, there were many times, many years that I had a lot of resentment and bitterness towards my father and the abuse and alcoholism and all, but... I chose to change my belief system subconsciously about my home life and, and change my perspective. But that was a long process of doing some work and uh, energy work and a lot of other different things to get to that place where today I can say that I was grateful for my childhood and, and I look at the positives that I got out of that home. I'm grateful for the uh, abusive uh, uh drug addict husband that I chose to marry uh, and the lessons that it taught me and all the great things that came out of that. I don't think we should ever shoot our messengers, you know, but what they taught us and what we learned from that. But uh, it is about having a different perspective. And uh, that's why uh, I agree. But I hate, I've always hated, I never would stand up like in a CODA uh, meeting or an Al-Anon meeting years ago when I used to go to those. I, I never never would stand up and say, hi, my name's Debbie and I'm a codependent because I knew the power of my words and the power of claiming that. And uh, I, I couldn't say that. And I never have really agreed with, because I know the power of affirmation and the power of our words of continuing year after year, after year, after year, standing up in a room and saying, my name is Joe and I'm an alcoholic. My name is Joe and, or Tom and I'm an addict to continue to claim that identity and even after years that you haven't uh, been involved in alcoholism or uh, addiction that you wear that as a badge or you wear that as an identity right. um uh I'm, you know but yeah. you know that's and how i want to take it just a little step further because i love what you're saying completely and i agree with you a hundred percent and it is a deep process because the moment you start defining yourself as an alcoholic as a drug addict as anything that's less than a holy innocent child of God, a being of light, a, a anything less than that, what I want you to say, the power of your words, and we hear that a lot, the power of words, okay? Be impeccable with your word because the power of your words. But I just wanna take it a step further, that the reason you have the power of your words is because you have the power of self-hypnosis. And your words hypnotize. Your words hypnotize mm. you and your words put a spell on those people around you. The power of your words is the power of hypnosis. And whatever you believe, you believe by the nature of the word believe, you've already fixated your mind on an idea. You've disregarded everything else that might be contrary to that. And that's what hypnosis is. It's a fixation on one idea that you become it regardless of anything else of the information because you no longer see that information. So when we say words to ourselves, where 
I just want to, we're hypnotizing ourselves. When we're telling our story, we're not only hypnotizing ourselves, we're looking to bring other people into our hypnotic trance because trances are mutual. We go into mutual trances, and that's why, that's why people who drink like to be with other people who drink because they're all sharing the same, you know, alcoholic trance. Or people with drugs want to be with other people with drugs because we're all sharing. You know what I mean? You know, just like, just like Republicans and people, I mean, all the people who go to Donald Trump's, you know, things, they're all in the Trump trance, okay? So, <laughs> Trump trance. Trump trance. Trump trance. Trump trance. Okay. Trump trance. But, but, but that, the that's moment, a good one. <laughs> we, the moment you're in a trance, you, you're no longer aware of the things around you and the power of the mind is such. Remember, people forget the power of the mind is such prior to uh, full anesthesia, we use Can we lose Did him? we lose Brian? Yeah, I, I can't hear him. I think we lost you, Brian. To hypnotize people. In yeah, it may be. Oh, he's going to probably have to pop back in again. That's really interesting, Debbie, what he's saying, because it's 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 really true about how, you know, what you're saying about the labels and a lot of times I think that could be, would you agree, Debbie, could be used as an excuse to say, you know, okay, I'm an addict, I have a disease, it's not my fault. But yet to me, when I think about it, addiction is the only disease that reaches out and literally selfishly destroys families, loved ones, um, terrible behavior you know like when somebody has cancer they don't run around and steal well here's here's the other thing here's the other thing about it being a dis you know claiming it's a disease that is true if you claim it's a disease it is the only self-diagnosed disease you know you can go to the doctor and they can tell you you have cancer we found cancer we found right. diabetes but no one can tell you you're an addict or an alcoholic if you don't believe that and own that it's, right. It's the right. only self-diagnosed when, when someone says, yes, I am an alcoholic. Yes, I am an addict. I claim that disease. I, you're the only one. You, can, you know, you can sit and tell someone till they're blue in the face. You're an addict. Your you're, life's unmanageable. Uh, you're always using or you're always drunk or whatever. And they can sit there and go, I don't feel like I do. I don't think, you know, as long as they don't believe they're an addict and, or an alcoholic, you can talk to your blue in the face. So it is the only self-diagnosed um, condition, uh, disease, or whatever you want to call it, um, until that person owns that thing, can anything be done about it? But, and, but there's a line there. So in one hand, obviously, you have to get to the point where you say, okay, I, am, I have an issue with this mm -hmm. substance that I'm using to mask my pain. Maybe that's better than saying I am an alcoholic. Because then you get into the, to the other part of uh, wearing the label. But if without accepting that you have this issue, then you can't get better. But yeah. if you go too far and then you wear that label forever, that's also detrimental. So maybe the, the key is to realize it's not who you are. You are not the alcoholic, but you have a problem with alcohol. Well, you have a problem with self-medicating yourself. Yeah. So and I think, pain. again, I think the root is, you know, not the alcohol or not the, you know, the drugs right. or the alcohol, what they're using. Uh, to for what they're really going on, you know, like you right. talk about people who, who drink all. You know, I know I've known people who drink. You know, you would consider them an alcoholic, and they realized it was making their life unmanageable and a lot of problems in their family and things, and so they just quit cold turkey. They quit, but they get they don't do any work on themselves. Right. Do, so we call them dry drunks. You know, yeah, they're not drinking alcohol, but they're miserable people. You know, they're angry, they're resentful, they're bitter. Um, you know, they're, they're people who will grudge it, whatever their personality and their issues don't go away. If the alcohol was masking that. So you take away the drugs and the alcohol, the real, that's when the real work begins is the issue. It's just like Christina, some of my clients who I see have been in recovery for cocaine or drugs or whatever for many years. And they're just now starting to work on their codependency, uh, relationship problems they said you know I, I've been going to meetings and abstaining you know I, I haven't been I haven't used for five years but and my life my job's great everything is in my life my finances everything is straightened out but I'm still having terrific relationship problems 
And um, they said, so now I need to work on my codependency. And I always say every addict and every alcoholic is codependent behavior. Right. You know, because show me someone that has those problems that has a healthy, good relationship. They don't. Right. You know, and it is all about the root of the, the you know, how we perceive ourselves, the lack of self-love, shame, feeling not good enough, whatever that belief system you attained by the age of seven, you know, growing up and in your, how you perceive it. And something else Brian said is so true. You can have 10 kids in the home and growing up in a dysfunctional home, every one of those, it will affect each one differently depending on their personality and their perception. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that I remember seeing and how it affected me and the feelings that I had growing up, my sister would say to me, I don't remember. I don't, I didn't feel that way. I didn't see it. And I would think, where did you grow up? You know? Right, right. And, where were you? <laughs> yeah. So we all see it. It affects us all differently. Well, that's real. And, you know, it's interesting. So say you have, you know, multiple kids in a family and you see this with the whole hereditary thing, you know, dad or mom, you know, coming home from work, upset, angry, reaching for alcohol. So one kid says, um, it learns in their brain, well, when, when I'm upset, when someone's upset, we have a drink. Where the other kid sees the bad behavior, dad may be yelling and screaming and says, I don't want to ever drink that stuff because dad yells and screams. So subconsciously, so this is what I'm kind of thinking yes, what yes, you're talking yes. about is that uh -huh. one kid seeing it, interpreting it one way where the other kids are saying, well, that's the way, right. that's the way we do it in our family. If you're upset, you pour a drink. Or yes. you draw, whatever you met in where the other someone who's against it will see it in a different way. So it's really that whole perception as a child, like you said, before seven, what you're going to make of that incident, like where you're going, you're, you're going to, how are you going to interpret it as a yes. small child? And that's what the tricky part. So that's why I think a lot of this whole hereditary stuff is because it's that behavior. It's all, you know, in your family, you learn from copying your parents and your grandparents. And if everyone in the house well, is I'm drinking, then that's normal. Yeah, I know my uh, brother, he was the only boy. And I remember he always said in growing up uh, that he was never going to be like my dad. My dad was an alcoholic and very abusive to my mother. And he's just say, I will never be like that. I will never treat women like that. I will never get drunk like that. And my brother ended up being exactly like that. Hmm. Just like my father. Right, uh, right. And I think sometimes uh, it's true. That which we fear comes upon us. That we can have so much resistance against something that right. we become that. And, uh, you know, thank goodness that, uh, you know, he has done his work and gotten into so much recovery. I'm working on his issues uh, to not have the desire to use anymore. But, uh, you know, it, it really is, um, you know, the brain is, a, is just such a powerful, powerful thing. And our, our subconscious and, um, you know, even, you know, even in a relationship, um, you're talking about a, a topic and one perceives it one way and the other perceives it the other. You know, you're looking at it both differently. And exactly. you know, there's times we just say, well, we have to agree to disagree. You know, I see it this way and you see it this way. You know, it uh, doesn't right, mean either one's right. right or wrong. So it's true, I think, too, in growing up, you know, in whatever home we grow up in, um, and I do, I do think it's important for us to, you know, have the awareness of in the beginning of how it did affect us without blame and judgment, you know. And I always tell clients, you know, we're not here to bash your father, bash your mother, uh, blame them and say, look what they did to me, how screwed up I am. But it's how it affected you as a child, what was mirrored to you, what you didn't get. You know, our parents are to be safe supportive role models to help children feel secure and safe and give us right. need. You know, we have certain needs of being loved unconditionally and accepted and feeling uh, good about ourselves and all. And so when you grow up, when you grow up in a home that those aren't met, uh, those needs aren't met, it does, uh, you know, it does affect you. I tell people, you don't just right. wake up one day and, and uh, with these behaviors and pick to be in these dysfunctional relationships it doesn't just happen you know You're right your, it's subconscious it's belief, yeah it's your belief system and how you see yourself i believe how you see yourself or else we wouldn't be attracting it 
And then also too, I mean, you, you think about it when you've grown up and uh, the norm is for a parent or everybody's drinking and uh, dealing with their issues and there's nothing else, no other coping skill given to you. You don't know anything else. Right. So if there's, there's no replacement, like for, I think for any habit, like Brian referred to it as a, as the habit or an addiction. It's like mm-hmm. when you smoke, when you're a cigarette smoker, which I used to be, you know, I stopped smoking 19 years ago, you know, it was cigarettes and coffee, cigarettes and a drink, cigarettes after a meal, cigarettes first thing in the morning. So when you're looking to quit, you have to replace those habits. Maybe you're going to have a cup of tea or do something, but you have to have the coffee all of a sudden without that cigarette is painful. So mm-hmm. I think that's the problem. Most people are left without any coping skills when they feel pain comes up and their emotional pain um, or in a lot of cases we see with the prescription drugs now, it's the physical pain. I mean, so you've got people and re- you're telling, okay, you're, you know, you had, you have like herniated discs in your back and you're in horrendous pain and we don't we take any more oxycodone. We'll just sit there and suffer extraordinary pain. You know, when you're in pain, you will do anything to get out of pain. So there's got to be some sort of relief in order right. to not have that, that, have that kind of addiction because you're, what is the person supposed to do? You know, just sit there in pain. And that's why we see a lot of heroin addicts now because they're getting cut off yes. from their Oxycontin yes. and going on the street and it's cheaper. And, but without getting to the root, like we were talking about today of the physical pain or emotional pain and pulling that out and seeing what it is, that brings us to, and, and um, is, is the, the most important part of the, this conversation is how do we pull the root? And that's, I wish Brian was back on so we could ask him that question. But yeah, yeah. Uh, how do we get back to that? You know, like, what do we do? Yes, we acknowledge it. Like you said, we look back and we say, okay, when I was five, I interpreted this. Um, just based from what I learned in Brian's class, like two weeks ago, we did an exercise and was really helpful. Um, because some things I told you had come up for me um, in the class about with issues with my father, and it brought back all these memories. And at the end of the day, uh, we did this, this at the end of the class, we did this exercise where we, um, we like gave it to the Holy Spirit with the Course in Miracles and gave it up and, um, and gave forgiveness. But the forgiveness, which was interesting, was to agree to have selective memory. And only remember, like he was referring to before, the good. So you vow to say, I'm going to only remember now the good with this person mm-hmm. and selectively forget. And it really hit me because it was like, wait a second. We can choose to believe anything we want in life, any perception we want. So why not? Why? What is wrong with forgetting all the bad stuff that happened with a parent and just remembering, focusing on only the good? Imagine if we all did that. I mean, that would relieve a lot of pain, right? If we could look at people yeah. in our lives and like, like he's referring, like seeing the good, like even ex-husband and say, okay, here's the good memories. Yes, the bad memories happen. I acknowledge them, but I'm not going to remember them anymore. I'm just going to selectively remember the good memories. And then you'd have a different attitude, I think. Well, here's it. At some point, I think that we need to do that. However, if that, if I had clients do that, if I have women who are living in abusive situations, because that's what, that's the denial that codependents get in, uh, is that they're trying to look at their son who's using and saying, I'm only going to look at the good at him. You know, I'm not going to look that he's out using, he's a, he's a, you know, a drug addict. Um, he's a sweet boy. He did clean the garage out Saturday. You know, I mm. appreciate that. He did, he did come home by his curfew last night. So, or if, if a woman's in an abusive situation, you know, well, he does pay the bills, you know, he is a good dad. To oh the boys. yeah. That's different. So that's different. Yeah, you, yeah, you can't, you know, I'm going to not in current. No, right. I'm not, not going to forgive. No. I'm not going to keep forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. Um, you know, there's, you know, that's where a whole nother top where boundaries have to come in. We have to have reality of what's going on sometimes to protect ourselves to do the healthy thing for right, ourselves. Right. And, um, and also I think in the beginning, it's important for us to look at how did that father or mother, how did that affect me? The belief system that I got from that dad, how is that showing up in my life today? That's causing me not mm-hmm. to be successful or reach my goals or not have healthy relationships. How is that showing up in my life today? How am I myself by my subconscious recreating my childhood and my belief system? And, you know, one of the, I'll share about something about my belief system was uh, growing up in the home that I did uh, with my father. I had a belief system that men were controlling and mean and, um, you know, they, they had the, they, what they said went and that you, uh, 
You could make it without a man. That's the message I got by what I saw in my home. So because of that belief system, I attracted men like that who didn't right. respect me, who didn't, you know, and I didn't know how to get out of it or didn't know to get out of it because my mother mirrored to me, it doesn't matter how they treat you, you stay. You always become loyal. You stay, you stay, you stay. And so that's how I thought it was supposed to be. I didn't know any better uh, until I did the work of changing my belief system, seeing like that's a false belief. That's not true. Now, my right. father was charismatic. He was a great personality. He was fun. He was uh, very, you know, never met a stranger. He loved the poor. He loved the rich. He was very giving. Those are all the wonderful things about him that I try to contribute, you know, get. I want that in my life. That's part of my personality. The part over here that was the abusive alcoholic that affect, that's the part I want to change. And, and, and I have gone through the forgiveness and all that with my dad and love him and, uh, today. But uh, there was a time where I had to own that how I grew up was showing up in my life as an adult today. And well, you know, just to clarify, I totally agree with what you're saying. And, and the first step before what I was saying about, you know, having that selective memory um, would be you have to acknowledge it. You can't be yeah. not in reality. So whether it's past or current, you have to first deal and with the with the pain and um and seeing it, yes, yes. acknowledging it and it, and seeing the truth of it before you could go to the porn to say, okay, well, I'm ready to put this to rest. And if you're in a current situation, yeah, obviously you can't, you know, just be in la la land. Oh well, it's okay, you know, this person's doing this and that because that's affecting you and you know yeah. in, in the yeah. moment and stuff too. I think that's really important. I'm glad you brought that up because it's no way are we saying you know for you to just sit there, but oh, it's okay to be abused because it's not. You need to get yourself out. But, but then, you know, I think what'll, what'll happen is if you pull back the, peel back the layers of the onion, you'll see that it's not even like you said, the person, because what had come up for, for me when, when um, I was at Brian's class was it first came up something about my ex-husband and forgiveness. And then I realized I had all these insights. What I was talking about had nothing really to do with my ex-husband. All of a sudden it jumped back to childhood, right. being bu bullied on a school bus. And then it went even further back to my dad yelling at me when I was little and stuff and that being the first bully. And so like it, it all made sense. Yes, all of a sudden. Yes. And it went, and so it just wasn't even if we keep pulling back the onion, get to the center, you know, it was what was, you know, and so probably what I'm saying is you're a lot of your clients right today who have that husband, right? It's, you got to peel back that onion and go all yes. the way back to the beginning yeah. to see yeah, like why, why you chose that husband. Yeah, why are you even in this situation? And that they don't have the empowerment to leave. They don't feel, you know, that they can leave. They, they don't see that. You have to help right. them get to the point to see that they're not trapped and they can't leave. But that's a process, you know. When people right. say, why do they stay in that situation? Why would they even stay there? You know, their perception they don't see a way right. out, you know, so until they do this work to, you know, be able to see um, and get strong enough and change their belief system. And, you know, that uh, and I know I, this stuff that I was going to talk to Brian about uh, was that pleasure center of the brain, which uh, controls, you know, addiction. That there's that limbic, that part of the brain that that says we're having pleasure, you know, whether it be that we just meet a new relationship and it's romantic and wonderful and that pleasure center of the brain that euphoric and at that time our that's when our t-cells are really producing you know and our immune system is high we, we don't get sick at that time uh, when you are euphoric like that and in love that pleasure center of the brain is when we are at our healthiest physically right and so with addiction their brain is telling them that the greatest pleasure is that next high or going out and getting drunk, uh, you know, getting that drug, going to get that drug that, and it's the brain, it's that pleasure center of the brain that is saying, this is how I, this is the greatest pleasure to me. It, it kind of like lies to you, you know, this is my greatest pleasure is to go get high. And so uh, I think it with, with addicts, it's very important. They have to learn. It's like learned behaviors. He brought up learn new behavior of, being able to have pleasure and have fun without substance, without, mm. you know, getting drunk or getting high or without going and winning in a gambling, you know, that changing that part of the brain that says uh, about pleasure 
and uh, what's what's giving me pleasure. And, you know, today, you know, one of the things I was just reading a thing and I can't remember the percentage, but it was saying it was astronomical that uh, therapists that are sex addicts and sex addict groups uh, for therapy and all and treatment for sex addicts has increased like, I don't know, 225 percent in the last wow. in the last 10 years because of the Internet, you know people used to be addicted to pornography and all would sneak and go buy hustler magazine and go to these places where they could look at the pictures that remember that you could go to the like adult stores and look at things. Remember years ago before the internet, uh, that's when people were addicted to uh, porn and all. But today with the internet, I mean, you, anybody can be addicted. You know, you could, it's their ha, people staying away from pornography off the internet that it has increased so much because there's so much more availability. You know, it'd be like if you could walk next door and get a line of cocaine if you're an addict, you know, or you could right. go, go, you know, get your heroin in the backyard or something. People that are addicted to pornography that used to not just go buy the magazines or used to not go to the adult stores uh, to see that, or the uh, strip clubs now can just sit in the secrecy of their home with no one knowing and enjoy their addiction. Right, it's readily, it's very readily, very available. readily available. That's 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 like an addiction. They were saying that has really on the rise and uh, needing more therapists and group therapies and accountability and support systems for uh, sex addicts and uh, pornography people that are addicted to that. Uh, that there's just not enough out there for them. And I think you know the whole thing, whether it's sex addiction, pornography, drugs, alcohol. It's again, what you said about the pleasure in the brain. It's, I remember Tony Robbins always said, you know, you people seek out pleasure and avoid pain. That's the basics of our, all of our behavior. We always yes. move toward the pleasure. And so when the, when, in order to break an addiction, I always said the pain has to be higher than the pleasure. Cause yes. if the pleasure is way up here and you're getting so much pleasure and okay, maybe you get arrested, maybe your family leaves you, but it's still the pain's still here, but that pleasure is mm -hmm. still right up, up here. You're not going to make the switch. It's got to be that that pain is going to have to override those powerful yes. feelings of pleasure where like, it's like when you, you know, when, the way I quit smoking, I always tell the stories when I uh, was pregnant with my daughter and it made me so nauseous. There was no way I could smoke a cigarette. I went from right. being a cigarette smoker to it being, well, I went to vomit. So I just yeah. started again. Right. So that is, you know, that's an, an, another thing with that pain. I mean, we again, we're, whether it's physical or emotional, we're always going back to that of the, you know, whatever we're masking it with, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's still yeah. that deep rooted pain that everybody's got to try. And I think it's important if you can get, if you know, if you have a loved one or you, you are addicted yourself is to get into something like what Brian teaches the course in miracles, which is amazing. Or it could be anything, any sort of, you know, spiritual based work or yeah. at your church or anything to so you can start mm -hmm. looking or getting a really good therapist to go back and uh, be able to identify. And I think the key is with traditional therapy, a lot of times you just talk about it, okay? You acknowledge it, but then nothing else happens. That's right. So you need to have another step where you yes. say, okay, now what am I gonna do with this? I realized when I was five, you know, I saw this and it impacted me this way, but I don't know what to do with it, you know? And, and that's right. where you need somebody who's really good that's who can right. help you get mm -hmm. through that and be able to give that, you know, and pray over it and give it to the light and be able to, to resolve those issues. And, and that's it's, what it's happened a lot to me. Of hard work. Yeah. yeah, it is a lot of hard work. And that's why I love working uncondu uh, unconventionally with clients, not right. like original uh, and, and working with higher consciousness and spirituality to help them shift that subconscious brain. And you were talking about, you know, when the pain gets greater uh, than the joy of it and the pleasure of it. And, you know, I have to say that's why I always encourage parents and clients that, you know, you've got to stop holding that pillow under that child or that spouse and, and keeping them from the pain that you can love them to death. You've got to pull all those support systems, stop enabling, stop rescuing so they can finally hit a bottom and get into pain enough that they are, they're going to want to get help. But as long as you're coddling and supporting and enabling and rescuing them and making it soft for them, why would they want to get help? You know, why would they have the need exactly. to get that? And um, 
Um, how do you want to close out today, Christina? I have a client. Uh, yes, yes. Well, you know, I just want to um, say Brian has a great book um, called Seven Keys for Attention Development. And he's uh, Dr. Brian Sheen, S-H-E-E-N. And he also, if you look for the Seven Keys for Attention Development, the app, I recently purchased his app. It was only like $9.99. And it has some great videos in there for all sorts of this kind of work we're talking about. He's got these short videos that are two or three minutes long where he's on there talking to you and his meditation and it's all it's really great stuff so i i recommend that if you have any issues with codependency debbie contact debbie debbie what's the best way um for them to reach you well either by uh email which is debbie at inside out wellness coach.com or my website has a contact form it's inside out wellness coach.com and uh why don't we also tell Christina where he does, for those that are local maybe, where he oh, does yes. Tuesday night, this Course of Miracles. Yes, he does. Um, every Tuesday night, he has, um, well, there's two classes. One, first he does a meditation class, but then um, I think it's either 7.30 or 8, he does a Course in Miracles uh, group. And that's in Delray Beach, Florida. Um, let me see. I just want to see if he's got, let me look on here. It's probably, I'm, I'm assuming it'll be on his website. It's again, seven keys for attention development. And that, if anybody's familiar, local in, in Florida and Delray Beach, it's on Atlantic Avenue. Um, I'm not sure the name of the shopping plaza, but it's, uh, where the restaurant free house is, is in that shop. It's right. There, it's right. It's right there by the intercoastal bridge, uh, just west of the intercoastal bridge on Atlantic Avenue in Delray. Right. And that's Tuesday nights. Um, but uh, definitely go to his website. So you can get more information. And, I, and also, we'd love for you to get a copy, free copy, subscribe to addiction911magazine.com. And we have our, our apps as well. They're absolutely free. It's available for the, you know, for the iPhone, for the iPad, for Google Play and on Amazon. You could download it there. And just again, that's addiction911magazine.com. And we're sorry again, apologies for all our technical difficulties today. We want to thank Dr. Sheen for, for being on and giving us his insights. And we'll definitely have him back again. So I was going to say, let's, we're yeah. just going to have to reschedule, uh, you know, when things get better, the weather and the retrogrades over. And uh, yes. we'll have Brian back on because he has a lot of great topics and things that we can talk about pertaining to, uh, you know, getting to the root and belief systems and all that type of thing. So thanks Absolutely. everybody who joined us. We thank appreciate you, it. Debbie. Uh -huh. thank, thank you. Thank you guys. Have Take a great care. weekend. Bye-bye. Take care.